What's up, everybody, and welcome in to another edition of The Sit Down. As always, if you enjoy this video, please make sure you hit the like button and let me know what you think of the discussion in the comment section below. If you're new around here, you just haven't done it yet, or you're living under a rock and seeing this video for the first time, I don't know what you're waiting for. Hit that subscribe button below now so you never miss another sit down video. I'll also ask to make sure you hit the notification bell so you never miss another sit down video. Today, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to get into another very interesting organized crime topic. And there is a major cat and mouse game that we've seen as history plays itself out involving the American mafia, the back and forth between the mob and the police. Now, whether it's the local police or the federals, the mob has always had to go back and forth between them. Stories of deceit, like the mafia cops, but there's also been some very interesting ones, ones of Donnie Brasco and Jack Garcia. But the NYPD is a group that we don't talk about that much when it comes to battling the mafia. A lot of the time, it's dealt with on a federal level. One of the most recognizable faces in the history of organized crime fighting is of this individual, Joe Coffey. Joe Coffey for years was a police officer and down the road, a high-end detective in the organized crime homicide task force. He would lead with an iron fist and in the end would face a very interesting possible assault ordered by one of the most famous mobsters of all time. He was a colorful individual and we're going to discuss the story of Joe Coffey next on Sit Down Shorts. Joe Coffey was born April 3rd, 1938 in the New York City neighborhood of Murray Hill. He would grow up in and around the area of 3rd Avenue and 38th Street in Murray Hill. He would be one of four children. Now, growing up, Joe Coffey would talk about the fact that his father who was of Irish descent. Joe Coffey's parents are both Irish. His father, actually in the 20s, uh, before Joe was born, would actually make extra money uh, in the prohibition business. He would actually drive truckloads of booze from New York up into Canada on behalf of Irish gangsters and gangsters such as uh, Oni Madden and Dutch Schultz. As we know, uh, in the 20s, everyone was involved with prohibition. Now, Joe Coffey would say that his father, as a child, would tell him, never take money from people like that. Um, he did it because he had to do it, but he realized that in his son, Joe Jr., he had someone who had really probably wanted to always be on the right side of the law. Now, Joe Coffey would talk about, as a young kid uh, in the 40s growing up, his father was actually very integral in taking over a union uh, involving uh, truck drivers. Uh, local union 804 and coffee would tell of a story where the mob was looking to infiltrate that union local and coffee's father actually bucked and at one point uh, the mob uh, attempted to shoot at joe coffee senior from then on joe coffee who was a a young uh, kid at that point eight or nine years old he would say that he began to be infatuated by the mob he would go out and read books on organized crime he became just inundated with wanting to learn about the mob and I'll admit, I don't have that same story as far as my father being shot up by the mob, but I would agree as a young child, I would have maintained the same interest in it. Now for Joe Coffey, he didn't want to be a mobster. His goal was he wanted to fight the mob and take them down. But he talked about his really obsession with the mob and organized crime began as a kid after he saw what had happened to his father, where he began immersed in the uh, mob world and learning about it. It was said that Joe Coffey was also very intelligent. He had a very high IQ and was said to be a big time leader. Now, Joe Coffey, uh, after high school, where he would actually leave a little early, from what I understand, he would actually head into the army uh, where he would serve in a reserve role. Um, there were no wars in the late 50s, uh, right after Korea and before Vietnam, but Joe would uh, serve time uh, in the military in the late 50s and early 60s. Upon his um, discharge from the military, he would work some odd jobs, but he ultimately had a dream of becoming a New York City police officer. He realized pretty quickly that he wasn't going to make all told riches, but he had a calling, according to him. He wanted to be a member of the most prestigious uh, police force in America. In 1964, he would join the police academy, and in 1965, he would become a full-fledged member of the New York City Police Department at the age of 26. 
by the late 60s, Joe Coffey would rise quite quickly as a police officer. He quickly rose uh, to busting some pretty big cases and ultimately was watching the mob take over. He wanted more, and he would ultimately become what's known as the commanding officer of the Organized Crime Homicide Task Force, and he would rename it essentially the Coffee Gang. Joe Coffey was a mob buster. He wanted to go out and solve murders. He wanted to bring in big, big, big cases. And throughout his career, he would succeed very heavily in doing that. Uh, the Coffee Gang would actually include not only Joe Coffey, but eight or so high-end homicide detectives. Now, Coffey would say that the people that he handpicked were the most loyal of his uh, counterparts, and they were high-end guys that knew how to solve murders and take people off the street that didn't need to be on it. Throughout his career, it was said Joe Coffey would ultimately solve 82 different mob hits, including ones committed by not only the Genovese crime family, but the Gambino crime family as well. And Joe Coffey would actually, in his book, The Coffey Files, tell a very interesting story about one of the most interesting people that he had become involved with through a very minor arrest was Vito Arena, uh, once a member of the DeMeo crew. And he would talk about at one point, he, Vito Arena would be arrested inside, you know, he didn't want to go to prison. Um, so he began just kind of spilling his guts about the many depraved murders of the DeMeo crew. And Coffee would talk about all he essentially had to do for Vito Arena was get him a bunch of food like pizza, hamburgers, French fries, and he would just begin talking. And that the one thing Arena wanted on behalf of his testimony was to be in the same cell with his gay lover, an individual called Joey Lee. Um, this is a, a guy that was a hitman, but he was a gay guy. Uh, and Vito Arena uh, quickly kind of began kind of spilling his guts. And Coffey talked about that was something that ultimately led uh, to, to the uh, indictments on people like Nino Gaggi and, and, and individuals like that. Um, but this was just one of the many people that uh, Joe Coffey would come in contact with in his career as he began attempting to bust the mob. Now, the one person that Joe Coffey would have some very notorious run-ins with uh, was the Dapper Don himself, John Gotti. Now, like John Gotti, the one interesting caveat between these two individuals was they both loved to dress well. It was said, we obviously know that John Gotti loved to look nice, but it was said that Joe Coffey was himself a very snappy dresser. And Coffey said that he would get that from his father, who taught him very young to uh, want to look the part. And Coffey would say he would pass that down uh, to his uh, many kids as well. But the run-ins with the Dapper Don were legendary. At one point, Joe Coffey began investigating Gotti in a connection he had to an individual called John O'Connor. Now, John O'Connor was a union delegate, at one point was shot by the mob, um, and Coffey began pursuing Gotti. At one point, had enough to arrest him. And in his book, Joe Coffey would tell of a story where um, he you know, kind of pursued Gotti as they walked down the street. A Gotti was with an individual called Jackie Giordano, who was a capo. At one point, Coffey would order Gotti, quote, stop right there. Turn around and put your hands on the wall. Now, without protest, he would say Giordano and Gotti would both kind of, um, you know, put their hands up. Um, but they wanted Gotti. So G Giordano kind of ran and ran back to the uh, Ravenite Social Club. And he would say that as kind of a crowd gathered, Joe Coffey would, would kind of run his hands uh, up and down Gotti, you know, patting him down. And this was a very personal exchange between the two. At one point, uh, Gotti um, kind of just snarled and laughed, but Coffey would say at one point that he was frisking him up and down his back to which he found something uh, near the waistband of Gotti, which he thought was a gun. At one point, Coffey would say to Gotti, quote, are you wearing a gun, you cocksucker? To which Gotti responded, quote, it's only my belt buckle. Now, it was clear that at that point, Coffey was considering possibly taking it up a notch and pulling Gotti to the ground, which would have been a very uh, interesting move if he had happened to do that. Now, this whole situation will play itself out. Gotti will get some revenge or what he thought was revenge on Mr. Coffey in a moment. But uh, these were some personal run-ins that Gotti had. And this is where the uh, f famous quote that Gotti had 
Coffee would put Gotti into the back of a patrol car and they'd be sitting in a car to which Gotti would say to Coffee, quote, I give you three to one, I beat this. And now down the road, as we know, he would beat that rap and we would come to find out that the new nickname of John Gotti was the Teflon Don. Now, while John Gotti sat at MDC, he began stewing about his run-in with Joseph Coffey. It was clear Joe Coffey was a tough dude. He wasn't going to take any shit from Gotti, even calling him a cocksucker. Uh, Gotti uh, wanted revenge, to which he would go to his trusted lackey, Jackie Knows D'Amico, seen here on the right. We always would see Jackie in the different footage. Now, Jackie D'Amico is a very interesting dude in his own right. I'll probably do a video on him at some point. Um, but according to Mikey Scars de Leonardo, he would say this uh, recently in a Patreon show that he did. At one point, he was kind of a, a protege of Jackie Knows, and he was one of the people that kind of schooled Mikey Scars in the runnings of the family. At one point, as a young up-and-comer up in the Gambino crime family, Mikey Scars would tell the story where he would be contacted by Jackie Knows D'Amico regarding Joe Coffey. Mikey Scars would say essentially that um, he was ordered by Gotti to tell Mikey Scars to, quote, handle Joe Coffey. Now, the order was uh, John Gotti wanted Jackie Knows to tell Scars to beat up Joe Coffey with a baseball bat, to which Mikey Scars would respond, quote, you got to be kidding me. Now, Mikey Scars knew he would have a better chance of shooting Coffey versus beating him up. And got, uh, Scars would say at one point, quote, you can't walk up to a guy like Joe Coffey carrying a baseball bat. He's going to see you. Um, now, according to Mikey Scars, he would say he was definitely prepared to take on the uh, assault, uh, but it never actually got there. Uh, the order would down the road be canceled. Now, several weeks later, Mikey Scars would also tell of a funny story where he was with Colombo heavyweight Little Alley Boy Persico in a restaurant in which Joe Coffey walked in, you know, kind of holding court. Mikey Scars would say that jo Joe Coffey kind of accentuated being a gangster himself. Um, while he wasn't a gangster, he was a cop. He dressed the part. He looked like a gangster, if you will. Uh, and Mikey Scars kind of joked that he didn't know how close – uh, he actually was to getting a beating by the mafia. But um, we know that during this time, Gotti was not only ordering beatings on uh, Mr. Coffee, but he indeed, through his son, ordered a beating on uh, Curtis Sliwa, who wasn't talking very nicely about his family. Um, but John Gotti and, and Coffee definitely had some legendary run-ins. And as we know, John Gotti would ultimately convict it and die in prison after serving life. Um, and in the end, uh, Joe Coffee likely got the last laugh. Now, we would learn of some pretty sickening accusations made by uh, Gambino turncoat John A. Light. John A. Light would try to sell a bill of goods that at one point he was personally taking money from Joseph Coffey uh, on behalf of payoffs and things of that nature. I wanted to include it because I do find it to be ridiculous. Anyone, including the family of Joe Coffey, in some of the conversations that I've had seemed like Joe Coffey was really a man's man. He was a cop's cop, and he loved being a cop. In fact, one of the family members of Joe Coffey would say at one point that Joe Coffey was so inundated in being a cop, he knew that cops didn't make a lot of money, but he was in it because he felt he was called to be a cop. At one point, when we addressed the fact that Joe Coffey, whether or not he took money, the truth of the matter is there's no way he took money. And anybody that knew him would know that. At one point, according to a family member in the 80s, during Christmas, he would allegedly take jobs selling Christmas trees to provide extra money for his family. According to his family, it was all about morality and loyalty when it came to Joe Coffey. In the end, he was a mob buster. He solved dozens, almost hundreds of mob murders. And he was integral in not only putting away mobsters, but serial killers, uh, terrorist organizations, uh, groups that uh, are very bad and depraved people. Joe Coffey is really one of the most recognizable faces in the history of the New York City Police Department. In 2015, he would die at the age of 77. It was said by his second wife that they really enjoyed traveling and that Joe always loved watching sports. In fact, it was said that his wife would say that they would go to the Super Bowl every year. They would attend Final Fours, and he loved going to Saratoga Racetrack. 
At the time of his death, he was 77 years old. Joe Coffey is one of the most interesting people in the history of the New York City Police Department. His very uh, interesting run-ins with John Gotti were personified. But in the end, he represents a cop that we just don't see much of anymore in America. Joe Coffey was a man who ruled with an iron fist and he didn't take any shit. But it was said that he was always fair when it came to arresting people. He never had a bad pinch. He never arrested someone for not uh, doing what they're supposed to or whatever. He always made the right arrest according to his family. And he can be regarded as a hero according to them. As always, if you enjoyed this video, please make sure you hit the like button. And let me know what you think in the comments section. We'll see you next week here on The Sit Down.